Hello, everybody, and welcome to UFO Secret Space. I'm your host, Janet Care Lesson, and I'm here with Bruce Cornett and Suzanne Johnson. So I have a lot of information on Bruce and Suzanne, Susan on uh, CoreanRadio.com, and I invite you to go over there and check that out. But we're going to start with Susan. Uh, she's a um, kind of like a hybrid. I'm not sure. I'll let her describe herself because I don't want to miscategorize um, her. So we'll start with Susan, and then she can tell you about herself. And she wants to talk about singularities and black holes. And then Bruce is going to talk about, let me see what he has here. These um, are binary solar system. There's wonderful pictures on AquarianRadio.com and uh, UFO Hunters. And then we'll try to weave our two topics together because Bruce and Susan know each other and we've been on before. So let's start with, the, let's just do a sound check, make sure everybody's, um, on here, so let's start. Bruce, uh, welcome to the show. Doing a little sound Thank check you. here. Yes, How are you? Sound check. Today. I'm doing just fine. So you just said that Ruth yeah. Ruth uh, Gator Ginsburg Ginsburg died. I didn't hear that. Did she just die now, or was that earlier today? Yeah, she died today. Oh, it's on the news. Oh well, that's another mess. Another mess that's going to happen. <laughs> okay. But uh, just briefly, you're going to be talking about, and we'll cover, we'll go into your topic in about a half an hour or so. So, what are you going to be bringing to the table today? Uh, basically, a, a holographic image that was uh, presented by a, an UAP <clears throat> over a farm field on the uh, 28th of April, 1993, and it, it became the topic of a UFO hunter, a History Channel show called UFO Hunters, UFO Vortexes in uh, 2008 when it was uh, aired. And the video is on online, and it's also, the link is on your our webpage. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to go into that. And then, Susan, welcome to our show. Yes. Thank Great. you for having me. So we're excited to have you back. So you're going to tell us about what you know about the, there, there's a theory about the singularity, and I am not an expert on it. <laughs> so maybe you could fill us in on what is the hypothesis and why. Now you're saying that it's not true. Am I am I getting that correct? That the That's singularity correct. is not. Okay. So first of all, can you help us out here? <laughs> fill in the gap. What is this concept of the singularity? And while you're talking, I'm going to search a little bit and see if I can get um, something to maybe explain it to people. Okay, what is the singularity? What is this concept? Basically, they're saying that if a person is obliterated or sucked into a black hole, that if they survive, they will be suspended where there's no time or no space. And that they they will be living in the same scene forever, and then, and that they will never escape that scene, and it will always be like it, they show a serene, peaceful scene on the beach with the the waves coming in and stuff. And they're saying that um, because of this, it's like a quantum singularity, meaning that because there's no gravity, no time, or no space or anything, the person just exists there, suspended for for infinity. Well. I'm living proof that that's not the case because in my past life, when we were coming into the Earth's solar system and we were in the third phase of reconversion, we were flying a saucer type craft, which means that they were ET mm -hmm. human hybrids. They were not ET alien human hybrids from Lyra, from the constel from um, the ring nebula and the constellation of Lyra on the planet Nyenda. They stuck me with human Nyendans instead of the Archeron Nyendans, who are my real people, the Archerons. Okay, had we been flying with with our people, um, I would have been flown, flying in the Archeron ship, which uses Sullivan waves, which we never would have got it obliterated by the black hole because um, a Sullivan wave can can vectorially cancel out any, any kind of force acting on the ship from the, the, what they call the the field around the black hole, which is called the event horizon. 
That's the same thing as like the corona mm-hmm. around the sun. They call it the event horizon where the activity takes place. Okay. On the okay. surface of the black hole, basically. But because we were flying a saucer ship, I, I am a Zvatari, a navigator, meaning I, I can anticipate energy processes before they happen. Because we interface with the negative neutral quantum, the absolute vacuum, what physicists call dark matter or dark energy, uh, we can anticipate something before it happens. And just as it's happening, I'm able to interact with it and cancel it out or enhance it, whatever the desired effect is. Well, as a Zvatari, I woke up after we went through the third phase of reconversion. It was in a saucer-type ship, which is typically an ET human or an ET gray-type ship. And when I woke up, um, the rest of the crew, because they're ET humans from Nyanda, they were still asleep. And when the one person woke up next to me, Ekna, who is the pilot, I said, Ekna, Ekna, shift the mass to the black hole, not away from it, away from it, to the black hole. He was all groggy and, and, and sluggish, and he shifted the mass away from, from the black hole, and that's how we got obliterated by the black hole. And this is right over the Earth's stratosphere, right over the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and because of that, um, I couldn't um, – We, I was floating around for a while, and then I incarnated. And when I did, that was when my, my people found me. And where did you incarnate? Wait, wait a minute. Hmm? Are you there? Oh, she's been interrupted. She's been interrupted. Okay, well, we can carry on. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm back. I think she got okay, obliterated okay. by the black hole again. No, I'm back. <laughs> Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> so I'm I'm, I'm you, dealing you know, with extenuating circumstances domestically. Yeah, and that reminds me. I'm gonna put my. I have a sign that says broadcasting. You know, it's a red sign that says recording. If I put that up, I have a better chance of not getting disturbed either. It's like people know when you're on the radio and they go knock on your door and they call you all that stuff. And the cat. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Go out, kitty. Goodbye. Sure. Okay, so you know I have a question about that because that, and I want to go more into your story. But I had an episode that I recalled where I was in a, a um, on a planet, and it, it, it was uh, the volcano was erupting, and I got it must have been like uh, the vortex of the planet, so I got killed or got. Our species didn't have the concept of getting killed, but some, suddenly I was out of my body, and I was up at the top point where you disconnect from physicality, from uh, the other dimensions, and then you kind of emerge into what is it, whatever it calls, universal consciousness, oneness, I guess people call it the singularity. And I hovered there for a while, but the people that... The, my family, who were with me when I when this thing happened, that I was pulled it out of my avatar. It's not even like it was my body; it was my avatar that I was in, inhabiting to do this exploration on this planet. And they were able to bring me back, and I was incarnated into another humanoid form. So I had this clear recollection. I was confused by it, but what you're saying is similar to what, in my opinion similar to what happened to me. So back to your story. I just wanted to interject that. Okay, so for a while there, I was floating around, and it looked like a grayish, whitish backdrop with little tiny speckled black speckles all over, and it looked like little tiny, um, like, clear balloon, oblong balloon-shaped spheres floating around. And then the next thing I know, I'm in a uterus in utero or whatever, and then, and then, um, and then I guess, um, th- and then I remember being born, and I remember the doctor saying, "Welcome to the world." And then I thought to myself, "Holy shit!" <laughs> and then, and and then, and then, uh, okay, so then that's the only memory I had. And then, and then, when I was like five years old or seven years old, is when I had my first dream where I was obliterated by the black hole. Well, that must have sent a signal. 
to my people that I was ready to be awakened up to my true identity and what really happened to me. And I had the same dream over and over again. And when I did, I'd wake up and find myself cross-legged like an Indian facing a closet door, and I was shaking. Mm-hmm. Those bastards. So what? So you? And so the, you? <laughs> and it so, seems that they can so, they, they can pull you into incarnations because there's a similar story can, when uh, Stuart Swerdlow they can, they was can, out of his body, and then he was pulled into. He found him, next thing he, he was he was at the Philadelphia experiment, and then he fell over the side, and he was you know kind of floating in you know whatever that is not space wherever he is. Next thing you know, he's coming down through the birth canal, and he's being born as Stuart. So that's his story, if you ever track that. Yeah, see, what they, what my people are able to do is they're able to tra- um, track a, a residual energy signature from the soul. And we're very close anyway. Mm-hmm. We're a very close-knit soul group anyway. So we, we have a very strong one collective consciousness of psyche. So if any anything happens to any one of us, we all know it. We can track down... Every soul, everything has a residual energy signature to it, and they can trace it to the soul pattern or the soul matrix field wherever the soul is. And then they can work on that soul. They can either incarnate it into that embryo or fetus by modifying its biomatrix configuration, which is what they do by taking the egg out of the uterus, and they'll, and they'll, and they'll remove some of the contents, and they'll graft it with the DNA from the past life body that that person had. And they'll modify it, and they'll put it back in the egg and put the egg back in utero. So then what they do is then they, they, will, mod- they will monitor it and make it evolve into certain specific uh, confi- or dimensions or configuration or a certain path they want it to evolve into. And then after the person is born, they will wait until the person reaches what they call maturity or until the person is ripe, which means – where the person's psyche is now ready to accept their training and inculcation and everything else and awakening into their true identity. And that's when, and that's usually triggered by a past life dream. Like, like in my past life dream, it was of me being killed in my immediate past life over the earth's atmosphere. So then Mm -hmm. they took me up in the ship. They showed me everything. They showed me um, my Archeron parents. They showed me, the ship, they showed me my people, and they even said, had you been on our ship, you never would have been abducted. And I wasn't supposed to be on the earth. I was supposed to be up working. On, I was supposed to be doing the same work, but I was supposed to be up at ships. I wasn't supposed to be physically down here in a physical human body. But they had to make real quick adjustments real, um, so that they could uh, um, compensate for the fact that I got killed and everything so they could retain my immediate memory so I could continue on in my energy path at a certain par level performance. That make, you make a lot of sense uh, that we have a soul signature. And when I met my husband, I said, I know you by your soul signature. But I wasn't <laughs> – I had never heard of that before, right? It just came out of me. And it's like I know you because your soul signature. And when I met this man right before him, they were just one digit off, right? So I had these two people that were like – First and second out of the out of the <laughs> assembly library, or wherever souls originate from, with their original patterns, and they were so close, so I was so confused, and I ended up getting involved with the first person. But then, had not had I not gone down that path, I would never have met my husband, Doctor Les Sasha. So it was all perfect in some kind of divine plan. But it does seem like seem like things are orchestrated sometimes. Oh, like you said, you woke up, you had a past life dream, and then you were shown your information. Bruce, have you had anything like that ever? Have you ever been given information through past life dreams about your true Uh, origin of your soul? uh, Yes, uh, but mostly through hypnotic regression to past lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, with uh, waking Taking back, been taking back in spirit to past lives. Uh, so, <clears throat> yes, I I've been incarnating on this planet for uh, thousands of years. Uh, so, I'm not like uh, Susan, who is 
is a, a newbie on, on earth right now. Right. So we'll go back to you, Susan. I want to stay focused on you, but I did want to interject a little bit here to get uh, everybody's opinion to include it. So continue your story. So you're showing, what's the, the, the species that is your real uh, family? How does that work? These are your real families. They were, who okay, you are okay. on a higher you level? Ever, they were my true parents because they're from what they call the soul group, my soul group. The family I'm incarnated okay. into now are not, not only are they not my soul group, they're psychotic and are extremely dysfunctional and greedy and selfish. And, mm-hmm. and, they, and they hate me because I'm different. They never accepted me. And I, I, I've accomplished a lot on my own without their help. And they right. hold it over me that I have to still stay here at home. The ones up there, they embrace me. They love me. They accept me. I'm part of their soul group. I can feel the warmth, the compassion. I can feel a very strong maternal bond to them. And I can remember being seven years old, being taken up into the ships and being shown my true parents and feeling an immediate maternal, paternal bond and and crying because I didn't want to go back home because those were my real parents. And I was just a little kid, and I didn't want to leave my real mm-hmm. mommy and daddy. But no. They, 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 they said, no, you got to stay on the earth. You got to finish the work from down there on the earth. And they put me down there and I woke up pissed off. I was crying. Right. You know, why are you, po- yeah, why are you I... punishing me by making me stay with these people? I hate these people. They don't like me. I never felt close to my real, mo- my earth human mother or my, especially not my earth human dad. Yeah. Well, I had relatively nice parents, but I still felt like, I was abandoned on Earth, a stranger in a strange land. So, I've had, I felt that. Bruce, how was your family? Did you feel that you belonged with them, or that you were somehow abandoned with these crazy people? <laughs> what was your? <laughs> no, I fit. I fit well with my family, and uh, I was okay. well taken care of and raised. Uh, you know, uh, I had um, major things happen to me during my childhood. Uh, but, uh, you know, I felt loved by my parents. I don't. Yeah, I, I, I got, I resolved it with my parents before they died, but my mother was very abusive. She, she thought she had given birth to the demon seed, so she kept trying to kill me. And I don't know how your parents act out with you, Susan, but my, my mother just could never adapt to, having this child that wasn't quite human. You know, she just kept acting out. But go ahead, continue with your story. I'm, I, I'm sorry you, you're you still apparently going through it because you're still involved with my those people. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, but fortunately, my parents have passed on, and so I have a different perspective. They've been gone 20 years now. But it's different when you're in the midst of it, and it's very dysfunctional and disturbing because I'm, a, 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 I'm always being attacked every day, verbally attacked every day, every day, verbally attacked. Mm-hmm. I got I got a narcissistic, fascist, control freak tyrant who th- thinks he can bitch at me about everybody else, and I'm supposed to monitor everybody else. And then as soon as I start saying mm-hmm. anything, he jumps down my back and accuses me of starting a fight with everybody. So I don't bother saying anything. And I still get right. it. The rage boiling over. If there was a caldera, I met. I'm very sorry that's happening but, for you. As but you know, uh, Janet, I was um, I was married to an extraterrestrial incarnate as right. my late wife, and she told me how her mother knew that she was not normal, not of this earth. And wanted to, she tried to uh, abort her when she was pregnant with Bonnie mm-hmm. and uh, mistreated her after she was born. Uh, and quite, just about quite as bad as, um, as uh, Susan has been mistreated. But uh, nevertheless, uh, she was rejected by her own mother. Yeah, that's sad. I can relate to that. 
So you don't, I, and I don't want to go into solving your problem because I, I don't think we can do that on a radio show. Well, and, ben, and, you know, the ben, hour ben, and a half. Ben, yeah, but. yeah I, 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 I understand. And I was going to get back to the black holes. So um, when I looked, okay, so when I started learning about these black holes. And then, and then I figured out at the age of seven, at the age of nine and 10, this is 1967, 1969. I started learning that there's two different types of black holes. This is what I knew before anybody was even talking about them. And I figured, oh, they must know about it. They're just not talking about it. But I knew that there's two different types. One is called a mass density black hole, which is created by collapsing matter like a star. And the other one is called a neutral current black hole, which is an opening that opens up from one plane that it separates two dimensions in the universe. And you can use that as a portal, like a door to walk walk from one room to another it's like a portal you just go from one dimension to another and then and then there's a floating black hole that can be used to um be artificially produced and and turn it into a streamer or a coupler or a, a wormhole and then it can be systematically collapsed that's an artificial black hole and then there's natural floating black holes and i knew all of this at the age of nine years old and then, so, and then, and then, that, um, so you're saying it's a pretty accurate description in, in science fiction, or are they off? And if they are off, how are they off? Okay, you know, in, in, all, the, in the, the sci-fi reason, series, yeah. Well, the sci-fi is closer to describing what it really is than actual scientists, because okay. the scientists get bogged down in all their equations, their terminology, their nomenclature. They're so-called what they think the laws of physics are, and they're losing touch with the very medium they're studying, which is the universe itself. You're supposed to open. You're supposed to approach it with intuition and open mind, and with a systematic observational approach, and not assume anything, but let nature teach you. Okay. Well. It seems like we're receiving education. Somebody's trying to educate humanity in, through science fiction. And somebody's getting the real information, so they're conveying it to us. So go ahead. Continue with what happened to you. Okay. The, okay. So if you look at the actual black hole itself, that's a misnomer because the black hole is a black sphere. Why? Because the black hole was created by a collapsing star. Well, a star is typically spherical by nature, oblong, spheroid, egg-shaped, or spherical shape. Mm -hmm. Well, when the star collapses and creates the black hole, it too is spherical or whatever. And the reason that the black hole – I think Stephen Hawking was correct when he said eventually the black holes canceled themselves out because what happens is in the black hole – you got a shell, and then you got a, got a ball in the center of it, or a point charge, or a point source of energy in the center of it, and then you have the, the surface of it. Well, what happens is the surface, or the the general field between the surface and the point source in the center, the net the net if it's a two opposite charges, the net charge is zero. Supposedly, the net vectorial force cancels out, and it's zero. But they 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 come in closer and closer because of the gravitational force, which is a neutral force that attracts the two together. The gravity, anti-gravity, whatever. And then eventually when it collapses, it, it, the, the, the shell will cancel out the, the shell charge will cancel out the point source charge and they cancel each other out and they no longer exist. Here's the other thing. The, it, if that's true, that nothing, no light or nothing can escape a black hole, then how come it has a quasar beam going out both ends of it where the poles would be? Again, they've disproven right. their own theory. Stuff does escape from the black hole, X-rays, gamma rays, and, and, and um, the, the, the beam of light, the, the quasar beam that comes out of both ends of the black hole. Like, like the poles on the so, earth, the north and the south pole, the similar. Okay. So they're wrong. I mean. Right. Correct. But the, wrong. So what it was. So then, so then I found out later on that 
there was apparently some kind of a rift, or they call it a spatial rift. It could be just another fancy name for floating black hole. I found out that they mm-hmm. that they open, uh, or there's a spatial rift that opens up, and it was a Dr. Lee Shardell, and he was given a, a lecture about it, and it, and uh, the Miami chapter of MUFON meet, meeting back in um, 1992, and he was talking about um, um, the a spatial rift that opens up, and but he wouldn't give the he wouldn't give the parallel where it opened up. And he wouldn't, and he wouldn't say how frequently it opened up, but he said it it was aperiodic, meaning it opens up sporadically, but it does seem to follow a, a specific period, like a timing, like every seven years or every five years. But it, it it varies. But he said he wouldn't give exactly where it um, opens up. Well, I had a good idea where it opened up, but I think it was the Bermuda Triangle, the twenty fifth parallel. But he wouldn't. Oh, say. and. He, but uh, that was my impression. Was, yeah, the, the the Bermuda Triangle or something. And then, and then he said, and then he talked about Chulos. This is another interesting thing. He said that SETI, even though they mislead the public into believing they haven't detected any real extraterrestrial signals yet, they have been directly communicating with another ET planet called Chulos. C H U L O S. Where is Chulos? And apparently. Or I, I forgot. He said something like in 30, 33 degrees in the west or something, some, and I forgot the constellation he said. But he, basically I remember the name Chulos, and I remember him saying it was mostly a water world and that most of the beings on there are cetaceans, meaning do, like por, you mm-hmm. know, whales, dolphins, porpoises, whatever, mm-hmm. but they're advanced right. and they communicate. And then, and then that's not all. I also found out later on. Actually, Bruce is the one who sent me the information, telling me that SETI is sending signals re- periodically to M- a star cluster M13 in the constellation of Hercules, and what was it, um, uh, 305 Hertz or something? What was it, Bruce? I, I don't recall. Uh, but this occurred a while ago with uh, Carl Sagan sending that signal out. And it, it, it was it was the Arecibo Antenna Array in Puerto Rico, right. and they were sending, yeah. and, and you, and, and, and it was eight twenty three hertz or something. And that's my birthday, eight twenty three six zero. And you said it was like three oh five. Okay. Yeah, and they and they do this periodically, and they've been doing it ongoing, and they're pretending like they haven't made any contact. Interesting. And then the boot, booties is the one. Um, they have an opening in booties, a big black void in booties, and I think that's the um, opening to one of the Alpha Draconis portals that runs parallel to this universe from Taurus to um, Cygnus and um, um, Draco and Lyra, which is why this is. these are two very hotly contested regions right now in this universe as far as the wars and everything up there. Right. So tell us about the, that a little bit. Uh, when, when, once you once you finish this subject, because I'm I'm getting all these things while you're talking, I'm very sensitive. Um, so are the Dracos coming through? They're probably here already. People are always worried about the travel part. Well, yeah, once they're here, they're here. They can set up colonies anywhere. Uh, but is that the original connection? How the Dracos got here? My, no, okay. Originally, the Dracos and the Lyrans and the Cygnusians and all of those and the Booties and all of those people, Arcturians and everything, our Arcturus is in the constellation of Booties. They're all here already. They're indigenous races of this universe. What had happened was right. mm-hmm. um, on, on, on the backside of um, this universe, possibly around the Alpha Draconis portal region, um, we – and I know it was probably us that did it. We collapsed an, another universe because it was really rife with a lot of negativity, parasitic entities that sapped the life force out of all the living matter in that universe. And it was 98% negative, and it had to be collapsed. And some of the disembodied evil entities escaped through the portal and came here, and they targeted the lesser evolved, lower dimensional, polarized um, beings like positive, negative, bad, good, whatever – 
very lesser evolved beings, lower dimensional beings, because they knew that they can overtake their bodies and use, use their bodies as vessels to – and they mm-hmm. can inhabit them and, and control them and make them do nefarious evil deeds. And what they do is they feed off the life force of all living matter. And that's why blood is a symbolic of the life force. And that's why all your evil disembodied entities will, will drink the blood of um, various different beings and stuff, whatever, babies, all that stuff, because they, they live off of the adrenal chrome from the blood. And that's the life force. So that's what it is. And You're the here, first person that's and, explained that. I, that's, I've heard that being said, you know, but it never made sense, like, why the blood? But you're the first person that's made, given us a logical explanation. That's well, fascinating. I, you, hear bits and, <laughs> you, you, you hear bits and pieces of information out there, but it takes somebody on the outside to put it together to make a perfect pattern. Mm-hmm. See, like on Ancient Aliens, the series, they talk about blood. Why is blood such a thing? Why did they have human sacrifice? Why did they have the Aztecs and the Mayans and stuff? And that's another story. But basically, it, it was the evil, and they, and they always passed themselves off as angelic and white flowing blonde hair and, and here to save humanity, but you got to give a sacrifice and you got to worship us. No, they're the negative ET tall whites that have been – Overpowered and controlled by the disembodied entities from the other universe, the collapsed universe, and they're feeding off of the life force of all the living beings. That's why they want to subjugate and enslave the human race. They, uh, the same beings came down and started at least three known major religions on this planet with different ideologies so people can keep fighting and be in strife. Cause that what's the, what's the three rain, main original religions they created? What were they? Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But you also have right. Zosterism and um, Baha'i faith as well, coming from the same uh, origins. Yeah, there's always breakout yeah. groups. So you have Christianity, and then it breaks down into Catholicism and and uh, Protest, Protestants, and then it goes into well, well, Mormons it's, and it's, and all the others. Catholicism is the yeah, Mormons. Because they, they single-handedly the tried to wipe worst. out. Yeah, because they, they wiped out – they single-handedly tried to wipe out all the ancient knowledge, all the ancient, ancient mystery schools, all the ancient medicinal um, remedies, everything else from all the indigenous peoples on this planet. Each of these indigenous peoples on, these, on this planet were, were represented as the sub-colonies of the, five hum, or the seven human colonies that were supplanted here on this earth. And not all of them are from this planet. Maybe one or two of them are indigenous directly to this planet. And, when, and each landmass is marked by the rows of holes um, that if you were to develop – I'm not good at math, but this is just my observation. If you were to develop a good computer algorithm to analyze those rows of holes, like say in Peru and in Africa and in and the, and the Karnak Stones and Brittany, France – and in all these other places where they find these rows of holes, what you're going to find, it's most likely a mathematical representation of that specific genome related to that specific colony. It might even predate the human colonies to the alien colonists that was using this earth as an outpost before the humans were put here. So what's, what's the rules of the Anunnaki in this? They're evil. Are you familiar with the Anunnaki? Overall, mostly they're evil. Are there okay. any good Anunnaki? Is it like humans? Or we're, no. we're, we have evil ones, and we have some that aren't so bad. Okay. The ones that are most likely good are the Orion Creator Councils that called us in to help out in the first place, and also ones from Procyon, which is in Canis Minor, and also um, there might be some from Arcturus, and maybe even some from Sirius, but not the negative ones. Now, are Pleiadians negative yeah. or positive? The Pleiadians are Pleiadians. Are they negative or positive? Both. And that, and that yeah. See, I think it's that's mix. what I get. It's complex. It's like you, it's just like humans. You can't say all blacks, all whites, all reds, all blues, right? You people right. are I mean, unique, and, and, and some are good and some, some are bad. Yeah. 
and, and there are some like the Nibian Gaki and, and the Pneumo from the Canis major system, and, uh, and that's the Sirius star system, um, the Sirius B and Sirius C. And then uh, the Nibian Gaki and the Pneumo are positive, and they're, and they're tall black beans. Mm-hmm. And, and but but um, um, Pleiades is very complex because okay how it, how it goes is that the um, um, this is what I understand it from my vantage point from what I remember um, when the negative disembodied entities came over um, they targeted human types because they were the lesser evolved types in this universe and they started to overtake them and manipulate them and when they did. They they festered and, and they controlled the Vega star system and the constellation of Lyra and then they and then they used that as their main base like the seat of their council and then they went forward to Lyra and they waged all these wars trying to wipe out all the indigenous races of Lyra and the Ring Nebula was the center of all the main wars um, the center of all the conflict in Lyra and um, and then also M13 was a star cluster in Hercules as per and I looked it up, and Bruce Cornett told me that Kara came from there, and, and she was a tall white, but somehow her planet got destroyed, and they were involved in the conflict. I vaguely remember the, the renegade forces, and that we were supplying the renegade forces, and we got them off world before her planet was destroyed. Um, and, then, and then we went to Nyenda. We settled on Nyenda and the Ring Nebula. And we were living with the um, Nyendans, and they were humanoid, but they were more advanced. Formoid, I wanted to call them formoid, but I don't know if they were. Formoid, they look human, but they're more dimensional. They operate above the threshold, above the veil, they call it, dimensionally, and everything. And they're more benevolent, more integrated type of being. Um, we how, lived there you, for a while. How are you saying we, that? Can you spell with how that's spelled? They're, what are you saying? The fumoid? Spell that for us, please. For, formoid. F O R M, like form, and then oid. O I D. Oh. Okay, formoid. And they are above. What are they above again? They're above. They, they look, for all practical appearances, they're humanoid, but they uh-huh. operate above what you, what you call the longitudinal electromagnetic transcalar energy interface or throat. Interface or threshold region. Otherwise, most spiritualists call it, here call it the veil, because above that, the veil. It, it, okay. it, that's that's like that's like the fourth dimensional planarism, and then above that is the fifth dimension and beyond, and that's when you start becoming more of an integrated being that operates on a principle of of trilogy instead of dichotomy or polarization. Now that's and you're more of an integrated uh, being. You- you operate in trilogy, and that's how we get the the biblical, the Holy Trinity. So we, if we go above the veil, we're operating in trilogy. Fascinating. Right. I hadn't another, made that connection another word before. Thing. If you look at the seesaw on the playground, the fulcrum is in the middle, and then you got one kid mm-hmm. at each end of the seesaw. Those are the three points of operation right. of the system. Positive, right. negative, neutral. Even in electronics and in any acquiescent point and thermodynamic systems, you, 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 you shift the, the zero point, which they call zero point energy or whatever in, in the esoteric terms, and you can, you can change that state of that system from solid liquid mass to plasma, see, or solid liquid mm-hmm. gas to plasma. So it's the same thing. There's a principle of trilogy that exists all throughout the universe, but you just have to know how to recognize it in any kind of system that you're looking at. That's an example of universal dimensional thinking. Thank you. That's shifting me already. <laughs> I, I think this is awesome because you, you're explaining things in level. I don't know how many are getting this. I don't know. I think sometimes when – we have new information like this. You know, a lot of people have to listen to it three or four or five times before they get it. So I'm hearing a lot of this the second time, but and, and we're not re- really repeating. But I'm, you're giving us a download of the nature, like I've never really heard one quite like yours. The nature of existence and how it is, and and how it works. And I I really appreciate that. Well, I think what we're going to 
probably need to do. I don't know if you have the equipment, to, but perhaps do some kind of PowerPoint down the line. Um, cause oh, yeah. Put some visuals with that, that you, and slow it down. You said we something about probably, what, what are the Anunnaki? Okay, the Anunnaki is a council. Yes. It's, not, it's not a planet. It's a council. i got to get back to that because you asked me that. The Anunnaki okay, is a council. Yes. Right. They're not really considered a race uh, as per the misinterpretations of the cuneiform text and the Sumerian writings that ancient aliens presents. It is not a race. It is a council, which would explain why there's been different factions and, di- and, di- and, and different fighting and dissension among the Anunnaki, like Enlil and Enki and everything as examples. And and they might even represent right. factions. They may not be just one person. They might be a name of a faction, and that person represents that faction or is leading that faction. And um, now here's the thing. Well, I they identify said they... with Nima. So I have this past life story, and I, I don't know. It's like I censor myself. Were you Nima? Am I a fractal, fraction, a fractal of Nima? Uh, it's like I have this connection with the soul of Nima and her intentions and desires. Uh, what she really wanted to have happen here uh, as humanity being part of her uh, extended family, her uh, DNA, her spiritual family. And so she's uh, kind of really distraught <laughs> and weeping. And uh, although she's, uh, recruiting people to help help humanity, help the species. And I know you you are having problems with humanity, and a lot of people are because we feel betrayed and abandoned. But there yeah. are some people here that are really good, some souls that are really good. And it's it's especially hard when you come in and your parental figures are not providing the, the nurturing that you need, you know, to to begin a life as a human. You really need a strong foundation, and yet you come in and it's very, uh, you know, convoluted. So I'm, like I said, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you went through it. I went through a similar thing, but then you have people like Bruce. He had a good foundation. My husband had a good foundation. So those people can help us kind of pick up the missing piece, pieces but you're still in it, so I'm really concerned because it's hard to recover when you're still being abused. So I don't know what to do for you, but we'll talk about that somewhere in time, or it might just emerge from our conversation. Um, but right okay, off, so the, bat, off wonder, the top of my head, I'd say get the hell out of there. <laughs> you know, just get the hell out of there and somehow. I, with, 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 with what? The only thing I can do is sell my body or, or sell parts of my body to, to make ends meet. Oh, that's another story. I've been blackballed. I'm not sure. I've been I'm not sure. But I did this. I did it. I don't know how I did it, but I was in this. I mean, I was going to die years ago because it was so horrendous. But somehow, I'm. I think it was ET intervention. I ended up getting on a plane and moving to Hawaii, and I escaped all those that craziness because they. I would have been dead. Back in the early 90s, if I had escaped, I don't know how you're still with us. But at some point, somebody, I had an intervention, but I don't know exactly how it worked. All I know is I just said one day, I'm out of here, and I divorced my husband, and I got on a plane. I negotiated that, but you're in a different situation. I don't have your answer, but I know there's a way out, and we'll, it will emerge through something, our dialogue or we're going to ask the ETs, your, your family. you got to get Susan out of there, guys. You know, come on. Get her out of there. Because you can't think straight when you're being abused all the time. And you're, you're doing incredibly well, despite the constant abuse. I just wanted to give you that feedback. Okay, so back to the nature of existence and what's going on there. Okay, so the Anunnaki, okay, this, this is what I understand very specifically. And also the information came to me through a very hostile, abrasive, antagonistic bitch, and um, I got it from her. And even though I, I, I'd like to jump through the phone and get her, the information she gave me made me start thinking. And when I did, I came up with some very startling observations. One of them is 
okay, I don't want to mention names, but I'm going to have, I'm going to speak in generalities, even though I'm trying to be specific. Um, the ships, you ever heard of a planet class ship? You know, a ship that acts a like planet. a planet that's got a race of people. Yeah, we, we have planet. that concept in the Death Star, um, Star Wars. We were kind of introduced to that concept that a ship can actually. Okay. Something like we that. Call that it, our, my, people, my, my people call it a surrogate planet class ship. Surrogate because it acts like definitely like a planet. Because they have enough enough of a mass, uh-huh. it has enough of a configuration. It can have a central planetary energy vortex. They can act as a planetary persona and an identity, and it can match with the with the with the planetary identity and the universal identity of the given race that's on board the ship. And they can match the bio matrix with the central planetary energy matrix and the common collective soul matrix, which is a soul group. Most tip, most other higher evolved races are more strongly monotypic and have a stronger sense of identity and oneness. And that's why when one person sees another person from the same race, they recognize each other instantly on the soul level. Okay, that's one instance, like what you were saying earlier. So then, then okay, so then I found out generally when the Bible talks about heaven and my house has many, house, many mansions and many rooms – that's describing mm-hmm. a planet class ship. And then oh, the Anunnaki Okay. Now and then and then the, that the Jesus lives on there, the Muhammad and Yahweh and and whatever, Jehovah or whoever, and the Archangel Gabriel and Michael and all of them live on there. Clearly that's a class that is a specific clan of tall whites living on those ships. Now what happens is They have different compartments within those ships. Now, this is a mega ship. They would have different micro environments, and each micro environment would represent a specific planet of a specific race that's living on board that ship. And if you walk down the hallway, you can go to the left and go to the Earth, or you can go to the right and go to Enso or whatever you want to call it. Okay. Um, Why do you think? That they now remember, there's already four human colonies that were supplanted on the Earth before this happened. There's already two indigenous colonies on this Earth, and then the Anunnaki come down here in little Enki clans, and they produce a race of hu- slave humans out of one of those colonies or something. And that goes back to the other phrase, oh, um, the uh, what is it? The the, an- the angels of God saw the, saw the women of Earth attractive and had sex with them, and they're the fallen man. angels or something. Yeah, they okay. took them to be their wives. Yeah, right. Okay. Why would they do that? If unless there was already other human colonies on this Earth beside besides the the simians that they were working on to create their genetic base class to make no, to mine their gold. I, I have the I have the background on that, but I don't know. Anyway, they there were two there were two colonies. There was the Mars colony and the and the colony that was already on the Earth and they were using Mars as a transshipment station to, to send the gold back to Nibiru because it had an atmosphere that was failing. So that was the story. Now, um they 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 already had no. several generations of humanoids that were created. Let me just tell you the story that you know, my understanding because I don't want to get into an argument. I'm just telling you my understanding. I could be right. It could be wrong. It's not. That's not the point. So, or that, could so be they, they saw the daughters. The story. Of, I'm just explaining that biblical passage. The explanation was there were already uh, several generations of a humanoid um, Anunnaki hybrids. They had Adam and Eve one and Adam and Eve two, and all their children. So when when Marduk was having a web a wedding, um, the 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 colony on Mars, they didn't have women, and so they were, like, going crazy. It's like, we want to have wives. But the problem back on the beer is they were, getting, they, were, they were sterile, and they weren't able to breed. So they needed human beings because they were going extinct as a species. They were down to, like, a 1,000 Anunnaki, and so they no longer had hybrid vigor. So, so they, were, they were petitioning to marry them, and uh, 
you know, they had been uh, secretly meeting in other times. They were going back and forth. But when they came down for the wedding, they plotted it to just take, you know, 200. Uh, there were 200 more. There were 200, something like 200 of them. And that's the depiction in the artist's rendition of the rape of the same. Sabine women, right? It's been depicted as a, you know, raping. But they, they wasn't raping. These these people already were planning to get married, and then they 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 created a colony. I forget where it is. It was in the mountains. They went off in the mountains and they created their own colony. So these were one of these are a faction of some of the few remaining pure Anunnaki. But there were no wives for them. So the only way they could have children and continue, you know, and enjoy life and have um, companionship was to marry the um, the Anunnaki hybrid humans. They weren't marrying the um, what do you call it um, Bigfoot. They weren't Neanderthal. They were not going to marry Neanderthal, but the the hybrids that had Anunnaki DNA. They were very beautiful. They, they looked like us, and some of them were, you know, brilliant and almost Anunnaki. A lot of them had a lot of Anunnaki blood, but. It's kind of like uh, in, in human modern slavery, one percent, and you're you're black, right? Back in the days, one percent, you you were they were able to trade you as a slave if you just had one percent DNA. So that's the same with the Anunnaki. If a, if a person has one percent human DNA, they're still Anunnaki. They're, they're still human, and they're not going to give us the keys to extreme longevity. So. That's a little aside. Uh, Bruce, did you have something you want to say? You coughed or something, kind of like you made it sound like you wanted to talk. Do you have something you want to add? <clears throat> no, other than <clears throat> that my late wife uh, uh, claims to have been one of the um, Anunnaki. And uh, she mm-hmm. claimed to have been Min, Min Kursag uh, back during uh, um, Samaria and uh, – she would have been the mother of Enlil and Alki. That's what she claimed. Okay, that's all I'm, I, I can really yeah. add to this story. Okay, okay cool. um, now um, I, I want to go back Susan. to the surrogate planet class ships. Okay, okay if you ahead. have an atmosphere around an actual ball of rock floating in space known as a planet, and that atmosphere is called a biosphere because it has living organisms suspended in that atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And different, different numbers, different ratios, like so many good bacteria to so many bad bacteria or blue-green algae or phytoplankton, whatever you want to call it. Every atmosphere of every planet has some kind of living organisms in it. And this has scientifically been proven by um, NASA. The NASA's Unexplained Files, a series on TV where they found phytoplankton, pure phytoplankton on the windshield of the Mir Space Station and the ISS and stuff like that. Okay. Ah. Yeah. So when, when you see a UFO and it's coming down and it's sampling the Earth's atmosphere, it's studying the health of the biosphere, how healthy the biosphere is. Because there is a Mm -hmm. lot lot of race down here sustaining the planet, protecting the planet from CMEs from the sun, protecting the planet from a micronova event. That's why you'll always see ships around the sun and and helping to stabilize the central planetary energy vortex. That's why you'll see those octahedron or diamond-shaped UFOs hovering over different critical power points or something around the Earth, like over the Pentagon in the White House, they were neutralizing a toplet plasma-type bomb that was planted there by the enemy, or over the um, uh, Beijing or China or Taiwan or, or the Bermuda Triangle or something, or Russia, they're trying to stabilize different unstable um, geoid patterns on the surface so they can directly correct that portal configuration, feeding into the... Um, Central planetary energy vortex and stuff, and Odovar and the Overcon, they do most of that work. Okay, so we're go, um, all this stuff they're doing environmental maintenance and everything, climatology maintenance. Most open, what I call open planetary atmospheres, like on the Earth and everything, does not require unless you, unless you want to make cloud formation or unless you want to um, have a particulate precip- precipitation of rain or whatever you want to call it typically does not need um, fortification of the upper atmosphere with some kind of a metallic substance, whether it's gold or silver or something else, unless you're going to do something specific to that atmosphere. It's usually weather control. Now, 
On well, there was something hand, about you, they were losing their ozone like we were losing, like the same thing that we had happen where the ozone was being destroyed. There was a hole. They had a hole. That was the story. Maybe. But I think that Nibiru was yeah. a planet-class ship, and I think it was a closed system, and it was an atmosphere. And when you have a closed system with an atmosphere as part of the climate controls, and yes, I've gone up there in the ships and I've worked on different colony ships, and I've had to offset and adjust the climate controls, especially on the atmospheres and stuff, you need baffles that ha- that is plated with different types of metals that creates an uh, um, what a what a, a, a um, an, elect- an electrolysis of the of the gases, like you you change CO2 and and to like carbon and then O2, and then and then you'll precipitate the carbon out and then you'll you'll collect it on the bottom of the baffles and the O2 goes back into the atmosphere to re to resupply the atmosphere with gases. In other words, they didn't need the gold for a planet per se. I think they needed the gold for their surrogate planet class ships otherwise referred to as heaven in the Bible. Right. And I think I think what we're experiencing here is ancient people and, and the subsequent translators who are trying to explain something that they have no words for. You know, it's kind of like John, the, the, the one in Revelations, who's describing, you know, bombs and nuclear holocaust, and he's putting it into his terms of a man that's from, you know, 2,000 years ago. So I think we're dealing with that. So these people who wrote in cuneiform did not have the terminology to effectively describe what was going on. I agree with you. Mhm. Yeah. So your theory is, is really a really good one, and I'm always left with I can't prove anything. I just have theories and ideas and concepts and. You know, we just keep talking about it. Okay, so the, so what about the moon? Is the moon artificial? No, no, the moon is to... not artificial. The moon is definitely not artificial, although it could have been brought in to stabilize the Earth's wobble. Um, we we do have. Right. Um, I've learned firsthand from the Arquequians, uh the the black rectangular ship that I stood underneath for forty five minutes one day when I was in w- September. Of mm-hmm. 1994, when I was wa- walking um, down 106th Street, and I stood there at 88th Court and 106th Street, and it hung over my head for 45 minutes. They took me up and everything. Of course, that they didn't let me um, remember. I remembered it later on as a dream what they did to me. But anyway, the Arquequians do work with us, and they do planet creation and stuff. They were the ones who told me this word called PICT, P-I-C-T, PICT, and I had to look it up. And when I did, it said the third quadrant on the back side of the moon. And then, and then about two weeks later, mm-hmm. I had subsequent so-called recalls where I went up there, and they showed me their bases on the back side of the moon in that area. And then they also said that the Pictus stone, the bluish stone, that was um, in the northern part of, of the northern Irish and Scottish border is called the Pictus mm-hmm. stone. And I found out later by reading some an- uh, about ancient mystery, ancient places, about how these warriors blended in with the Scottish warriors, and then and they were fighting off the incursion of, um, I think it was the Roman Church or the um, English, and they they would be naked and they would paint themselves with the blue Pictish pigment, and after the war was done and the Scottish won their independence, they disappeared, and then you got High mm-hmm. Brazil. Which is also connected to the Obercon, the triangular ship, and and also the um, the uh, the Arquequians, um, because they were bluish people that lived there too in High Brazil, which is it comes and goes. I'm thinking it's a ship, and mm-hmm. and um, so this all makes sense. So the moon, yes, there's bases on the moon, and some of our, some of my races go up there. And now Bruce has a better explanation of why the bell would ring because he's a geologist, and he explained how after they impacted the moon, how there's different layers of striation of rock and how it will resonate in one level and another level and go around to the other side. And they thought it was hollow, and Bruce explained why it's not. Right. Now, what about the TR-3B triangular craft? Is that 
uh, reverse engineered from the triangular craft that you're describing? Some of it. Possibly. The military has a CRTB. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that's almost a just a general category for uh, triangular craft because there have been a number of different triangular craft that have uh, been called TR-3B. And uh, right. uh, two friends of mine and I uh, videotaped and photographed uh, one of these triangular craft putting on performances in near Pine Bush back on, um, in 1997. And we... Um, then uh, uh, my friend uh, Mark Whitford was told by uh, another uh, friend in the Navy who is still actively that we had been given, authorized <clears throat> a uh, performance by the TR-3B uh, uh, and that came from Skunk Works. Uh, I don't know <clears throat> how you could possibly verify that, but you know the, the, what, you have to ask the question, why were we given this spectacular performance, you know, 12 minutes of video of it doing all sorts of flips and, and reversals and upside down and things like that in the sky? Um, it, it, I mean, is this typical of uh, ETs coming in and, and presenting that information, or did they want us to think that it was ET? I don't know. Well, 97 is when they had the Phoenix Lights. So there, it seemed to me that there was something that was uh, that came, and, and that is one of our reverse engineered, but it is extraterrestrial, but it's reverse engineered. And I interviewed um, John Titer II, and he said he piloted the Phoenix Lights vehicle, and that's how they, they started to colonize. I guess we have two colonies outside of the solar system, and they sent out the TR, I guess it's TR-11 or something like that. I don't have it in my head. Um, anyway, there's a whole backstory on that. But there are factions of our, you know, humans that are working with ETs, and they get this, these uh, devices, and they're reverse engineered. But, you know, going back to what you were saying about the Picts, and I, I think that the Romans, that was Enlil, and, of course, Enki settled uh, Ireland and Scotland and England, so that was his uh, settlement. But they got invaded by the Romans and the, the Roman Catholic and the Catholic Church. I think that was Enlil, and that and that makes perfect sense because, from my understanding, Enlil didn't want the human race to be independent and self-governing or have its own sovereignty. They wanted to enslave everybody and figured humans were a commodity. Mm-hmm. And 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 Emke wanted wanted all of that. Um, he, and he we still are a commodity. From my my whistleblowers are telling me that we're they trade and sell humans all over the the well at least the galaxy, but perhaps the universe. They, they we are a very valuable commodity. We're good. We're good for slaves, for domestics, for sex slaves, for armies. <laughs> Get yourself your humans now. For, the, for who? It's only nine ninety five. The the the, uh, the, the, the negative the destructive the, the negative yeah. destructive who, who ET scourge that want right. that wants to wipe out all the indigenous races in this universe and replace it with a sterile bastard lacking energy human form. Why? Because they want to right. subjugate and control the very nature of physical reality. And that way they can get a grip hold on all the other adjoining universes and tell them, dictate to them what they want and what they can do because they're evil. There's no rhyme or reason to evil. It's parasitic, it's greedy, and it's, and it's destructive. It's like a cancer in a patient. You remove the cancer to save the patient. Well, this evil is visceral, and it's known as the negative ET tall whites and the negative ET scourge. And the humans How are, get are of some of the byproducts. <laughs> what? How? Oh, I know how. And those Nigashita said, beware, they come in, they shape shift, and they take over the members of the council. And while he got rid of them when he sunk to Atlantis, he said, beware, they will come back. And I think they're back. And I think that a lot of our political characters are, are taken over and controlled by these dark forces. And that's why, that's why we're here. That's why we were called in from the Urfactinum or fact the end of the universe. That's why we were called mm-hmm. in, because we're supposed to do a pulse uh, to eliminate every kind of evil at all of its manifestant forms, from the insect all Tell the way up to the pulse. ET. What do you mean a pulse? 
What do you mean by this pulse? Tell us language? more about that. In our in our lang in our yeah. language, the abrita uh 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 Mhm. And what is that? It's basically in human terms a silicon wave pulse that has all the imperme impregnated information on it, all the permutations on it, and each permutation representing each type of DNA or each type of soul matrix um, permutation of every evil disembodied or every evil bodied entity that exists anywhere throughout this universe. And we and we will pull we've got the boundary conditions set up, we got the perimeters set up, we got the matrix and sub matrix configurations set up on the sub threshold and threshold regions and even even the higher threshold regions as a safety buffer. We, we've got all the electromagnetic permutations taken into account. We got the biomatrices. We got the DNA configurations of every type of vile, filthy, disgusting, visceral, disembodied entity figured in from the mosquito to the tick to the diabolical killer to a Hitler to, uh, to a bastard father, everything. And then when we do the pulse, everything will drop dead right where it stands. And the soul of each entity will cease to exist. It will <clears throat> Convert back into a pure form of energy. So that's kind of like, um, you know, the the biblical interpretation is like the rapture or the you know judgment day. So when is this going to happen? How much worse does it uh, have to get before they pulse us? I, I I I ask that question every day. I beg them. I said, when are we going to do mm-hmm. this? Why do I have to suffer any longer? I want to hurry up and do this and go home. I don't know when it will happen. Mm-hmm. I just know it's supposed to happen, and there's been stalling and interference. And that's why uh, – what is it, Jeff Renz, uh, Mark Brickenhoff, yeah. and whatever, when he's talking, um, all the objections and everything, especially the Phyllis and their objections that they have, this is exactly what – I haven't listened to it, but they – they infiltrate. Well, it appears that counts. we should have had this a long time ago, but like you said, yeah, there's I agree. stalling I agree. and interference. And the, the interference is from within count, local council. The interference has been from within, within local universe councils that called us in. Now, Orion Council was on board with us, and I was told that a few days ago. And so is the what they call the Council of One. A lot of a lot of new ages call them the, the law of one. It's really the council of one. Yeah. And, then, and then the multiverse council, and then, and then our council from home, we all agree that we should do it. And I think local – I think Orion Council agreed that we, they gave us the go-ahead as to when we're going to do it. I don't know when, but I, I, I can't do – I can't wait fast. I'm, I'm, I'm extremely this, this impatient. It's not necessarily they call a us time in thing, but maybe – Maybe it's not what? a time thing, but it's a sequence of – maybe it's not a time thing, but a sequence of events must occur before that gets triggered, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G have to be in alignment. Maybe even the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, like something – we don't know. Any kind of event any day might be the final sequence in the, in the, the actions that must happen before we get this um, – Pulsing, it's called the pulse, the great pulse. Now, how if you are the, if you are a soul, and, and can you redeem yourself, or you're already doomed to be pulsed into non-existence? Is it too late, or can, point, I, can at, somebody find the light and la- change and be good, become good? Too late. If if they could have, if there was that possibility, it already would have happened. It's too late. The universe is already in its next phase of development and evolution and its next phase of dimensional convolutions and light, and light matrix configurations and the new light, harmonic light matrix, harmonic light res- resonances and everything. The, the physical plane, which is, which is governed by the baseline harmonic resonance that governs physical reality, has already been set and stabilized. Um, the, the primitive... Um, Diabolical, destructive, parasitic life forms have already been deemed obsolete, and and and, and there'll be several. I'm I'm assuming, I'm probably wrong. There'll probably be some major die-offs of lower, lesser evolved life forms, or something suddenly, because a lot of these 
lower life forms have been deemed obsolete, and then they'll they'll just die off through attrition. It's right. not a sudden event. So you mentioned it's not a um, sudden mosquitoes. Event. Like, is there any purpose yeah, of mosquitoes example. except perhaps for as food for other species? There's, I'm sure there's beings that eat mosquitoes. If we eliminate mosquitoes, will there be another food no, source for those no, that no, eat mosquitoes? No. This is what happens. You, as you know, when you got two scientists in a biological lab, one scientist is going to want to create a vaccine for something. That's the good creator. Another scientist is going to want to mm-hmm. weaponize a virus kill off the human population like COVID-19. That's the bad, evil creator. Mm-hmm. The evil creator created all these parasitic life forms, ticks, fleas, mosquitoes. The positive creator had to create some kind of a living life form that could eat them. But those same positive living life forms that eat those also can eat o- other things too for sustenance. So therefore, mm-hmm. you, you got to eliminate the, the evil, period, no matter what. It has to be done. We can't afford to hesitate, sit around, and second and third and fourth guess ourselves, and and be because that's what evil wants. They'll infiltrate the the, the higher order councils, and and they'll compromise them from within by planting seeds of doubt and questioning into those other leaders. So they start to second and third guess, and that stalls us and hesitates us. And that buys them time to regroup and reorganize and attack us. And that buys them time to so feed off of the life force mm-hmm. even more. At the, at the very fate so let's and look at, at, evil. at the very peril. Evil, evil is evil. anything that's self-destruct, self-destructive, destructive to others, destructive to the environment, and destructive to anything that's different in all phase of life existence and creation. So is it a percentage of actions that are that or if you do any of the above are you evil uh, that's what's confusing of you know what is it the most the, 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 the most disregard the, for consciousness the, the, so who go ahead if if it if it is a blatant arrogant disregard for others like my asshole dad um and you're motivated for Pure selfish gratification, and there doesn't have to be any rhyme or any reason because cancer doesn't have a rhyme or a reason, and neither does a virus. Mm-hmm. And evil doesn't either. By very nature, evil doesn't make any sense in its behavior patterns, and you could almost say it's right. unintelligible. Um, if a person is in pain and they're a victim and they're hurting, and they lash out in pain and they hurt somebody else. But they're not lashing out because they want to hurt somebody else. They're lashing out because they're trying to get somebody else's attention of their pain that they're suffering so they can get help. And then the other, per- the other people help them, and the person is remorseful and sorry and tries to redeem himself by coming around and saying, um, I'll try to achieve the same goals in a positive manner without hurting anybody or myself. And they want to be re- you know, redeemed. That's not evil. Even though they committed an evil act, they don't mean to. They didn't want to. If a person is doing it right. for fierce, m- malicious intent, that's evil. There's a difference. Mm-hmm. And the identity of the soul wonder, determines if it's going to be annihilated. The identity of the soul determines if it's going to be annihilated. So explain that. What does that mean? The identity of the soul determines. Well, obviously, you have, you have disembodied parasitic evil entities their souls are very evil and sadistic their identity is going to be very different than that of an innocent person who's not awake or an innocent person who's a Mm -hmm. victim or an innocent person who's feeling a lot of pain and a lot of negative feelings and a lot of negative emotions and are depressed even though that innocent person is a good person by nature there's a difference trust me okay so is that perhaps why in the lord's prayer it says Deliver us from evil. Yeah, but then again, I'm not so sure I trust Christianity because I think that that was a hoax perpetrated on the human race to subjugate and usurp them from from the evil negative ET Paul White. I don't even know what, what the origin of the Lord's Prayer wasn't. That supposed to be Jesus saying who who who, who wrote the Lord's Prayer? Um, John the Baptist. Look at John the Baptist. Yes. Yeah. 
What was the circumstances around the Lord's Prayer? Do you remember? Well, you know, he was Why asked. Why was he asking uh, you know, to be delivered from evil? Deliver it from... Yeah, he, he, he preached a lot, John the Baptist. Oh, here and that it was is. one of the things he it preached. Said the, he said the Lord's Prayer was spoken by Jesus of Nazareth as part of the Sermon on the Mount, delivered to an estimated 5,000 people and recorded in Matthew 6, 9, dash 13 and Luke 11, 2, 4. Since the Middle East culture of that day normally recorded only male heads of households in counts such as this, the estimated ter- total witnesses there the sermon was probably 12,000. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know where this person got their information, but um, so so if Jesus was the son of God and God, in my story, God, in those days, that was uh, the Anunnaki. And so I have two variations in my beliefs. <laughs> but I don't want to get into stuff of, of Jesus, but um I'm going to copy this. Go ahead. Back to what we were saying. Back to you, Susan. You're doing great. Take us to the Thanks. next section. So we're going to have this. We're going to have this. Uh, the day of reckoning, and people who are evil are going to get broken down into their molecules and and sent back to. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Because that's how they symbol it in um, – there's a series of books called um, – oh, what's he called? Not Conversations Beyond the Light. It's uh, Dr. Michael Newton, and he says that some souls, when they you know they go on the other side, they're dead, and some of these people are just so negative. They get recycled. You know, they get broken down to their elements, and they go back to the original, you know, source con- – universe consciousness, and they, they're back to their – basically their – Submolecular structure, and then they they get reassembled and sent out as a new souls after because they're so evil they don't want that evil to come out into existence because ultimately about the evolution of uh, all beings that's that's the theory with that. So okay, so who, who said that? They're 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 dead on. Who said that? That's part of the. Um, Dr. Michael Newton's Institute books on life between lives, and they have over 40,000 progressions into the where you go after you die. And they, they've been doing this for over 40 years, and they have uh, they've trained you know thousands of facilitators around the world. So it doesn't matter your belief system. There's some commonalities of where you go when you die. So the peers were kind of like in this loop when we're getting recycled back into – uh, forms, and we can we can take a form that's not of Earth uh, origin, but and you know go to another planet. But we tend to come into our own sphere, like the Earth, and keep reincar- reincarnating until we finally uh, grow and evolve, and we move to a higher dimension, vibratory frequency, uh, eventually. But not very. It takes a long time because. Human souls are kind of stupid. We just keep doing the same things over and over. God, you know it. it. You know it. (laughs) Yeah, we're kind of stupid. Oh, my God. (laughs) But they said that some are just so bad that they don't even send them back into – I mean, like, my thought was, well, what did they do with Hitler? But, yeah, what do they do with the Hitlers? And who are the Hitlers? Is You know, is Putin going to go – yeah, well, the day of reckoning. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, they are on the top of the list. Mm-hmm. They're they're what, what, what they call the primary harmonic resonance and the Sultan wave itself. They're going to be the first poof. So, what about a person who becomes a world leader? As soon as you as you take the oath, you're like, as a president. You've got blood in your hands. You're the head of war, and people are dying every day, and the buck stops with the president. And if anybody can deny it, but no, you, when you assume that office, you're the head of a killing machine that is wiping out life all over the planet. <laughs> you know? Okay. Is, okay, is that um, person get okay, recycled? Okay, this, How's this morality what, work? What, what, what about me, who's a light warrior, who's gone and killed thousands of races because they're evil? 
Yeah, I got blood on my hands. Yeah, so evil how does blood. that work? Yeah. Okay, be, because by yeah. by killing the evil, you're saving the gagillions of innocence. If you don't kill the evil, so who you're determines who's evil on this planet? Like they're sending drones, and there's a poor drone operator who has to push the button, and the drone kills a a whole wedding party, and there's kids and people that were just attending a wedding. And so, who's evil then? You know, it gets into that debate. Like Unfortunately, who's evil? Uh, you're you are confusing what a light warrior does up there. To what the primitive humans are doing down here, which is very sloppy and results in a lot of collateral damage. What we do up there, there's zero collateral damage. Right. So I understand it's different. I have a friend that, what when he was is a warrior. So when two when two species or planets had um, something they needed to resolve, they would send their hero, and the two heroes would battle sometimes to the death. Sometimes to they just yield, but uh, whoever won the battle, they got to make the decisions to resolve the conflict. It was just with two people, the heroes. I don't know what how you battled things out. If you had two teams, like in a football game, or no, no. How did you not, not destroy a planet and all of its resources? <laughs> very, very simple. Everything we do is wave harmonics. Light, light, no wave mechanics, light harmonics, and energy. Everything we do, all of our systems, everything that we believe mm-hmm. in, everything we do is energy. And because of it, we can be very specific and very surgical and precision at any of our operations. And we, it's like a neutron bomb or a backpack nuke. You can go into an area, you can set off the neutron device, it will kill everybody inside and leave the building and all the plants and everything else intact. Well, we basically, on principle, we do the same thing. It's the basic principle mm-hmm. of operation up there where we are. Mm-hmm. If there's two planets so how do you that are determine in conflict, if somebody is how do you determine if somebody is that evil that they need to be taken out? Who makes that determination? Well, I just told I just told you the criterion. They're self-destructive, destructive to others, in any way, shape, or form. Destructive to the environments. And they pose a threat to anything that's different and all innocent life form around it. Mm-hmm. Like a patient and the cancer. I, I mean, a cancer and the patient. That's just it. I have to keep right. reverting the back to that because that's the basic primary operating principle that we go on. And we now, don't determine. Sometimes there are assassins here on the earth, and I, I interviewed an assassin that had 135 um Verified kills to his credit, right? But my question was, who is making the determination that the people you killed were? I mean, because you could have just people don't like each other, and it's like we got to take that person out. Or you could have like a mafioso that's been killing. It's really hard to determine that from, you know, the outside level. But who who are the people making these determinations? Are they able to just read it in their soul? Or is it based on their actions and, you know, they did the 10,000 killings and so when they do 10,001, we take them out? I mean, I don't know what are the parameters, why somebody... Okay, I'll I'll tell you exactly what the parameters are. We look at their identity, their Mm -hmm. soul identity. We can also read what they have done in their past lives and their past because we read the residual energy patterns on their collective psyche. We can do that. Then we can also read what their intent is and and what they have done presently. And if the soul is positive and everything, but they're forced to do something negative, we'll figure out why and we'll mitigate that situation. If if it's on a planetary scale, if it's just a personal thing, unfortunately, they don't intervene on personal matters on a one-on-one basis. I wish they did. If it was um, two planets in conflict, we will immediately assess the condition to figure out is one planet trying to subjugate and usurp and scavenge and exploit the other planet, the resources in that race mm-hmm. and everything. And if that's the case, we will send somebody in to show a force to, say, to tell them back off. And if they don't, we will pulse the planet, a localized pulse to eliminate the evil running that planet. And then when they start the runoff in their ships, our scout ships and our warrior, our, our recon battleships will go after them. 
recon battle scout ship. So we go. So are you them. like some kind of? Uh, uh, what you're saying is reminding me of um, the day the Earth stood still, and there was Gort, uh, the giant robot that was the kind of like the police of the space that maintained peace at all costs. And they had warned humanity that if we don't stop our evil ways of you know nuking each other and warring, that they were going to come and neutralize us. Remember that? Well, for that day, the earth stood Thought still is a very dictated. prophetic message. Mm-hmm. That, 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 that movie was very prophetic and very profound, very truthful. That was a real message. And I'll bet you anything, whoever wrote it must have heard about some kind of an agreement that was trying to be drawn – that we were trying to draw up between um, um, the United States government and the military industrial complex and our people um because they were they, they they were on the fence they were in between whether they were going to go by way of the tall whites and the grays or they were going to go by way of us and become more um become more um benevolent and more self-governing and determined and everything or are they going to become more lily livered slaves of the evil elite and the um Military industrial complex and the negative ET, the negative ET scourge in general, and they went by way of them because it was the, the lazy way out. That's the human way. Um, they could get all their weapons and everything else, and the negative ET scourge can allow um, the evil elite access to all of their fleet. And allow the evil elite to take credit for it, like, well, we did this and we did that, and it's our secret space fleet, and it's Solar Warden, and it's this and that, when in reality it's the negative ET mm-hmm. tall whites and their fleet, and they'll allow the evil elite of the planet access to it, and they'll shower them with gifts and stuff, and return they're supposed to usurp and subjugate and suppress the human race because they want to use them as a commodity, and we've been up there fighting mm-hmm. all of that. Now, who are you? We again? What is your? Is it one species or a group of species? Who is we? No, that you're... we're we're an alliance of several beings, but but we're a very small group. But we're very powerful. And what beings are are in your alliance? No, uh, it c- consists of ones from Taurus, ones from Cygnus, um, some from Orion. Um, some Palladians are working with us. That's a very mixed up, complicated scene. Mm-hmm. Palladians is like really mixed up. It's like a very chaotic situation. I want to give Bruce and, a chance because it seems like there's some okay. tie in. I realize what time it is, and um, we'll, we're going to have to do another show down the line here. But, Bruce, so you have this anomaly that you record it, which you're interpreting as our binary solar system, and it really looks key. <laughs> Explain it. No, we have pictures of it on Aquarian Radio. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, uh, I'll get into that now. Um, it basically happened. Uh, uh, I was working with uh, Dr. Ellen Crystal at near Pine Bush, and she told me that uh, she'd been in contact with. Uh, the um, sightings um, uh, producers, and they wanted to do a story on her. And since I was working with her, I was involved in that. And Ellen wanted to go out the, the day before the sightings camera crew showed up and uh, just scout the area to see what kind of activity there was uh, going on in and around our favorite spot at the Dogleg Bend in West Searsville Road. Uh, between uh, Montgomery, Walden, and Pied Bush. And uh, so we went out there, and the activity was absolutely outrageous. There were ships flying all over the place. We got a lot of good pictures and video. On this one uh, <clears throat> time, I, we saw a craft uh, rising up over a, um, a farm field uh, to the east, and I took a type, two type exposures. And, of course, I didn't know what would show up on the, on the photograph. Uh, the, the light, as it was rising up, did something strange in the middle, and then it, it uh, pulsed down and continued to rise as it went south and then brightened and rose up and s- slowed down and then took off to the south. Uh, 
when I got the picture, I was blown away. It showed what appeared to be uh, a, a vortex. In fact, the uh, <clears throat> History Channel uh, and the UFO hunters did a story on this. In fact, there, that the um, event uh, was uh, gave the name to their show called UFO Vortexes, and they were interested in documenting uh, portals that were opening up. And this looked like a pretty good example of, of what could be uh, have been a portal that the ship was opening the portal up, and then it decided not to go through the portal. Um, and they came out in November of 2007 and did a whole uh, series of uh, shots and, and, and interviews. And then it appeared in March of 2008 uh, where they wanted to uh, say that this picture, which I is showed on your website, was a uh, vortex opening up. Well, I was not happy with that. Uh, I had... I read later on in, in um, well, actually, you know, you know, about the same time I was, I read a book by, or an article by uh, Walter uh, Crutenden, who is an astronomer, and he was proposing that uh, the, uh, the, the procession of the aqueducts involved the rotation of the entire solar uh, system, not just the rotation of the uh, moon around Earth on a particular cycle. And he uh, based his claim on uh, that the per Perseids meteor showers, those uh, all also precess in the same way that the moon precesses. And he said, mm -hmm. this is indicating that there is probably a second uh, dark sun, uh, a binary sun that um, is, is controlling Earth and how it uh, rotates. And when I uh, saw that image, I was uh, I, I realized that there was something uh, unusual about that blue star to the right of this the series of rings uh, that occur to the left, and the rings represent the <laughs> the um, um, the diagrammatic uh, orbits of the various planets around a central star. And then you go to the right and you see this blue star uh, with uh, some strange energy waves around it. And uh, we, you do know of this story about the, uh, the Hopi concept of the blue star. Right, and, the, blue, uh, that, the blue kachina. Yeah, right. And that uh, came to mind that uh, what I was actually looking at was our binary solar, uh, solar system where the, the – the dark star does not glow, does not is not visible in the night sky, right. and yet uh, our solar system revolves around it like a dish around a central point. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the rings in that uh, diagram, they're all uh, bent towards, like a dish, towards that blue star, suggesting that that blue star is has a very high level of gravity to it that is. Uh, Allowing the uh, our solar system to revolve around it, um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, crew tendons concept well, came to mind. Like it's very large. Might... What's it, what's the tail? What's the tail of light going? See, I, somebody said that this phenomenon happens, and that's why we have stories of dragons. There's a dry, like you well, know, a white well, the, tail the, on the, the, the blue star. There's an energy beam or a, a light coming from the blue star. Uh, as if it, it is uh, um, uh, sapping energy from our solar system. In other words, either giving energy to our solar system or taking energy from it. I don't know which, but there is a definite mm -hmm. connection between that blue star and and I. In that diagram, I I labeled a number of the uh, the orbs, the colored orbs within those rings of uh, that represent, I think, uh, planets. That are revolving around a central star, Great. and so um, how did you determine that's Jupiter and that's Saturn and that's the twelfth planet and that's the sun? by their by their what position your... by their position and size. Their position. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's all. So okay. I don't know if that's well, pretty... what they are, but I just put those labels there uh, to uh, suggest that this is our solar system. 
Now we know of binary solar systems uh, in other uh, parts of the uh, the this, the galaxy, but you know this was one that nobody had thought about yet. Uh, Crotendon, an astronomer, and he's not the only one who has uh, suggested that we may have a a, a bi- may have a binary star companion to our sun. But most people when they right. think of a star, they think of something that is glowing in the night sky, and yet this uh, star would probably be a, a you know a brown dwarf or a neutron star. But you know, I mean, I've uh, talked to uh, astronomers about it, and, and then immediately say, "Oh no, no, it couldn't be possible. No, we would have found it. We would have recognized it." And yet here you have uh, that diagram, that hologram that was. Uh, Flashed out over the the, uh, the <clears throat> uh, dairy farm field, and uh, so what is it? You know, why did they do that? Uh, were they giving us a hint as to you know, hey, pay attention, look at this, see? What do you? What's and, your answer? And, is that what you think? They're giving us a, a hint. They because they yes, didn't cover they, everything because this was intentional on some level. And they want you yes, to see it. it. You're the contact point, and they show it to you all the time. I guess so you'll get it yes. out to the world. Right, exactly. And that's what I did. And and it became the subject of uh, uh, a TV show on, on the History Channel, which is amazing. Um, the, mm-hmm. uh, the crews came out there. They brought me to Pine Bush, and uh, Bill Burns was the one who was involved in that and organized it all. And... Um, they came out with their mag- magnetometers uh, because I had uh, uh, the look, they wanted to come out to the um, the Jewish cemetery where I had found all of these mm-hmm. strange magnetic readings and uh, representing uh, beams of energy coming out of the ground in the form of a triangle uh, that they uh, used. They wanted to see what was below ground because I suggested that there might be something underneath underground that is uh, producing these energy beams firing out into the into right. space every time the constellation booties is overhead. So they were, whatever it was, was, was signaling something in space and it represented a beacon and a beacon could have been what is drawing all of the craft to Pine Bush and why the, you, you have so many craft being sighted around Pine Bush. So has this happened since and, this? Was this the only time that, this phenomenon, has anybody seen this since April 28, 1993? Seen something similar? Have they seen this phenomenon asking? again? It looks like a hologram, no. but it, it's hard to see what it really looks like. It's a picture that's from April 28, yeah, 1993. So it's a little bit grainy. I, I sent you, bit grainy, I sent you yeah. some other pictures uh, pictures of it. You might oh, want to look. Pictures. Okay, uh, I'll look for that. I'll look for that. Yeah. Okay. And I'll look for that. And but I wondered, has that happened again? Because um, in in 2013, 20, no, 2012, right? We had the story of 2012. That was supposed to be Nibiru coming through and possibly causing, uh, you know, some deleterious effects to the planet Earth. A.R. Right. Gordon in a meeting said that they deflect, they, they, I guess they, I'm hard, it's hard for me to explain. They, they, Blinked us in and out of time space and got us out of harm's way, and then they returned us. And that was supposed to be – that's what would happen in 122112. And we didn't realize it because they kind of reset everything. I'm not saying that quite right, but it's it's part of the AR board and Linkage Institute. There was a meeting because there was all the Super Bowl around 122112. And so that was a good 10 years – or no, eight years, nine years before – no, that's it. Yeah. Anyway, twenty-three. Yeah, yeah, no, years. twenty. Twenty years. Yeah, eighteen years. Okay, can't do math. <laughs> I'm just wondering. So that just seems like that was part of something that needed to happen. That's just an amazing picture. I'm just wondering, uh, is that going to tie in with what Susan's talking about? You know, these vortices, these singularities, these black holes. How does all this tie in? Because we don't see this every day, and we haven't no. seen this since it happened. So, what was going on? Well, according on to the, the Maya, that it showed up according on that to the Maya, uh, this is a very important period of time. 
And uh, one of the things that people were looking for um, was some sort of an earth change, you know, uh, earthquakes, right. volcanoes, and things of this nature. But what they forget is that these kinds of events uh, do not necessarily occur at a, a given stroke of midnight. In other words, they don't occur uh, at, at a particular time. They uh, cluster. And if you pay attention to all of the ma massive earthquakes that have occurred, from the Indonesian earthquake to the Japanese earthquake, et cetera, they all occurred very close to that 2012 t time period, and enough to suggest that they may have been uh, uh, you know, part of this pattern of, uh, of, of earth changes. And then you have to look at what man has done um, to the oceans and to the atmosphere, et cetera. And, and this is clearly uh, with the climate change, we're headed towards something very, very, very uh, different from the past that all of these right. uh, are, uh, storms, uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and fires is all coming to a head now because of the uh, radical changes in climate that have uh, caused areas of the West to dry out and uh, these hurricanes now are forming right off the uh, Gulf Coast. Amazing and things are happening. Them or this, is the, this is uh, so the last time we had... So my question for this panel here, is this a natural thing or man-made? So is COVID man-made or natural? Is are the forest fires in the, on the West Coast, the fires, is that harp? Uh, are we getting, uh, you know, the, the war, this, this modern war may just be, a, you know, a biological one or an energy one, and we're getting harped, especially when you have a dozen uh, hurricanes off the, you know, Russia has harp. A lot of the different um, cultures have harp, and harp is a weather control. So, Susan, do you have any right. insight? Because A.R. Borden's group intervened so we didn't have another catastrophe like what happened in Noah's flood in 2012. Your group is, is going to do the system where we, we cleanse the planet of the negative evil people. Is what's going on – I don't think what is going on now is natural. And I'm not sure – You know, I don't want to get into conspiracy because I think a lot of the conspiracies are used – Conspiracy theories are used to manipulate people to make bad decisions for their life and um, because right. it's another form of manipulation. So what do you think is going on? Both of you, we have about, I don't know, 15 minutes, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Well, well, you have to consider with the Earth, Earth human population uh, expanding continuously. I mean, uh, and um, the the – tax on resources and on space, uh, you know, lo location. Of, and, and I mean, something is going to break. Something is going to happen that uh, is a correction. I think it, it, it falls in the line that we see with um, in, the, in the ancient history of geology. My background is in the historical uh, history of Earth, in the evolution of life. And there were major mass extinctions. In the past, uh, where as much as uh, 70 to 90 percent of all the uh, species on the planet became extinct. But interestingly enough, with those extinctions, the majority of, of kinds of taxa survived. There was like uh, a Noah's Ark, one representation of each kind of plant and animal that did survive and uh, repopulated the earth. But these mass extinctions. Um, occur on a semi-cyclical uh, basis. They are not, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a, a clock. But what I re came to recognize is that um, the, uh, the the spacing between them, the the mass extinctions, was approximately approximately 65 million years plus or minus five billion years. And the last mass extinction was at the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary was 65 million years ago. And why would there be this cyclicity? Well, as it turns out, it, it, the, uh, our solar system revolves around the galaxy at about that same rate. And we come into an area of, of uh, uh, space rocks out there, um, asteroids that 
uh, that as we're passing through this zone, uh, the Earth has a higher per, a probability of being struck by, uh, you know, large space rocks. And uh, so you have that situation that everybody's concerned about right now. The astronomers are watching the skies, trying to identify everything that's out there that could potentially uh, have a, a Earth-crossing uh, path to it. That's major. Mm-hmm. But you know, remember, we, we, it, when I studied these mass extinctions, they weren't just a, an event that happened at a single time. They built up to a crescendo, like the, uh, the, the final uh, display in a, in a fireworks uh, display. You know, you get your, your final uh, event, right. uh, and that is the major one. But you have minor extinctions taking place uh, as much as millions of years before the big one. All right, and look how many species right. have been uh, disappearing from this planet. All the the mega man, uh, mammals only just what thirteen uh, thousand years ago. Come on now, this this is all mm-hmm. part of what's happening now with all of the uh, uh, the loss of species and extinctions of species on this planet. We're headed for a major uh, you know uh, extinction event. Wow. Okay. Now, um, I want to pass it back to Susan. Are you complete? Do you have anything else to say? Yeah, I Susan, are you there? Say. Go ahead. What would you like to add? Okay, the fires. There, have, I've seen YouTube videos from third phase of the moon and two other sources where they actually showed, uh-huh. I think it might have even been the suspicious observer, they actually showed a thin... I think that Gina Calvin Hill also showed a really thin, almost invisible laser going down into two or three points w- w- within the California fires. And I've heard that I've heard mm-hmm. that theory before, where the secret space fleet will fly even ships that look like flying saucers or UFOs to make us look bad, of course, and actually send lasers down and start the fires. And there's a, there's actually uh, two or three instances like that that were exposed or that, that, that were shown on TV, and I forgot the documentaries. I don't know if it was unexplained. I don't know if it was or Jonathan Wells' um, unexplained mm-hmm. um, UA, alien files or what it was. All of those, all I know is there's been instances where they've shown UFOs, and then I think that there was a person who was an abductee or something, and he he actually came forward and said, he saw a UFO start a fire by shooting a beam down into some trees or something. So it's quite possible it could be the secret space fleet sending down lasers to, to set forests and brush on fire on purpose. That's one thing. And as far as HARP, um, yeah, that thing is going off. But I heard a few times that um, s- um, certain unseen forces have neutralized some of the HARP grids and stuff and it was shut down. Right. And then um, – as far as as far as going, it is cycloidal by nature, and the blue star. I agree with that. I, I was wondering if it was a binary star system. I I just I always wanted a second moon around the Earth, but anyway. Um. And and as far as the humans, um, well, I have no comment there. <laughs> um. <laughs> And some of the heating of the Earth is being done by the interaction of the Earth and the Sun. Of course, they call it the weak, um, the weak interaction, strong coupling. Um, um, the, the negative neutral quantum fields around the Earth and around the Sun, they inter- interact and it heats up the Earth's core because the, the, the inversion rate of energy from one form to another is increasing. The Sun We've been setting, we've been offsetting that CME activity, and we've been um, stabilizing the coronal osmotic pressure on the surface of the sun to stop the, the sun from going micronova, and that's why the SOHO and the other satellites will see all types of unidentified flying objects and disks around the sun. Um, that's all I can think of to say as far as the volcanoes and, and the tectonic plate movements and everything. Um, you'll see UFOs going in and out of the volcanoes and in and out of the um, 
earthquake zones, what they're trying to do is they're trying to offset the pressure and stabilize it so it's not as severe. What is See, your opinion, Susan? You go ahead. What is your opinion of this theory that there's a tiny black hole at the center of the Earth, which is causing the heat? Um, I don't think that's true. I think maybe they're looking at some kind of an energy inversion field again, and they might mistake it as a black hole because effectively speaking, a black hole is a, is a spherical energy inversion field to begin with. It may have okay. some of the same properties. I wanted to go back, Thank Susan. You. you said that the the secret space program might have been sending a beam down to set the, you know, my thoughts are when you said that is that, you know, that's a blue state. So, the, you know, let's take out the blue state so the election will be skewed. What are your thoughts on that? What, who's sending from space? Who's controlling the secret space program to send it down and targeting California and the West Coast? That's all blue states. Because... I don't think politics has anything to do with it. I, I, right now, it's getting down to the wire. There are certain things that are supposed to align up galactically. I think Jupiter, if I'm not, I'm not an astrologer, but I, I think I was told that Jupiter is supposed to go in Sagittarius or something. Like in the November of this year, I'm not sure. And something Supposedly, that's when portals will be more accessible and stuff. I think mm-hmm. that the secret space fleet, bar none, is totally, completely controlled by the negative ET tall whites and the negative ET scourge. And I think the evil global elite are um, are in bed with them, and they're all operating together. And they know that something's about to go down, so they're trying to make all of us ETs and all the UFOs and everything look bad by disguising their ships as uh, as UFOs and going down and shooting lasers to start these fires to make the human population think that we're bad. In other words, Mm -hmm. another disinformation cycle warfare psyops program launched by the enemy. And, and, and I think that as far as the blue state and red state and all that, I think that these, these are players on, on the same team. And I think they're both being manipulated by the puppet master, the evil elite behind the scenes to keep the population distracted and, and caught up in all the bickering so that they can go, go right. on and carry on their nefarious evil activities behind the scenes unscathed. Yeah, that's, that's called active measures. Like they go in and just pit us against each other so we never figure it out. So we're always infighting, you know. Wow. Okay, well, we're just about out of time here. Uh, final words, Bruce, what would you like our listeners to know? No, well, you have uh, that video posted on your uh, webpage. I would like the uh, uh, visitors or listeners that are interested to go and click on it and watch that uh, video. They will be very much informed about what is happening around Pine Bush. It has happened in the past, and some of the things that I have um, discovered there uh, during that 11, 12 years of, of research that I did between 1992 and 2003. So, um, uh, yeah, that's probably all that I need to say. Okay. And, um, yeah, we're, well, I'd like to invite you both back um, sometime in October. We can do a follow-up show. Uh, there's so much, such a wealth of information coming from both of you that, I think it'd be nice to do shows, you know, maybe once a month or every six weeks or something to get this um, whole story I, I, out. I, 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 have, Susan, I have a you're... suggestion. Sure, yeah, I have a ahead. suggestion. Um, you had mentioned that you knew of a woman that was also like a super soldier or something going through the same thing I am. Is there any way you said you mentioned about a platform or something? Is there any way you could do a show where people like me that are just going through what I'm going through can actually call and try to set up some kind of a network or something? I'm working on that. I, I was putting out fires here at home <laughs> today. I've got to send out – I've got about five or six female – super soldiers and there's a lot of men super soldiers but the women it's even harder in some on some ways for them because 
uh, there's just a lot of uh, horrendous things that happen in our patriarch- patriarchal society. <laughs> and so I, I'm going to send out an email to these people. There was one a couple weeks ago. When I was interviewing this other woman, I, I thought of you, Susan. I said, i got to get you guys together. And then, you know, something will happen and I have to go put out a fire. So I'll, I think I'm going to have time tomorrow to get out uh, an invitation to people and then try to court. I'd like to have three or four uh, super soldiers on at the same time. And then you guys can piece the pieces together and I will facilitate the process. Although I've been in underground military bases, so I might be categorized categorized as a super soldier, but I don't have the same experiences. You are a category where you fight, so a lot of these women have been involved in battles, and I've ne- I don't have any recollection of ever being in a battle. So um, anyway, I'm working on that. I will, I will send you an invitation. I'm going to create some dates on the calendar. I'll invite you if that date and time works for you. You can come on board, and I think they'll do four at a time. So if there's too many people, it's it's too confusing. Three or four super soldiers and then me facilitating, and we'll do a series of them. So we'll mix and match. So um, what I find is can can you share on that deep level? Hmm? Can you send me her contact information? I will send an invitation for you to – I don't ever give out anybody's contact information, but I will – you know, facilitate the process. I'm not sure exactly, but I I cannot give out, you know, someone's personal information without their permission. So within those parameters, I'll do what I can to, um, you know, set up this team to help us all get to know each other. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just about done here with the time. So, well, um, so you, Bruce, you have a website, uh, you don't have a website, do you, Susan? You don't have a website, but Bruce, no. Do you have a way people can contact you? I uh, I think you have my one of my websites on your web page. Okay. Okay. To good. go to. Okay. So look there. Excellent. Excellent. Well, t- I want to thank you both for coming on board. I want to thank you, listeners, for tuning in again. And we'll be back in uh, sometime in October. I'm pretty much booked solid through the rest of the month. I don't even think I have an opening. Um, everybody's home with COVID, and they want to listen to radio. <laughs> so we're we're doing a lot of shows now, and it's, it's hard for me to keep up. But I enjoy it. I love being here to contribute to the awakening of humanity and all species and all beings, because now we're learning how many of us, how many ETs walk among us. You could be... Going to the grocery store and they're bagging your groceries. <laughs> you don't know. So be nice to all beings, no matter what their species. So thank Very you. Very true. Very much good. Love. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> thank you for inviting Aloha. us. Welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.